God's Word comes to us today from Psalm 51. Psalm 51, and we'll be reading the the psalm in its entirety. Hear the word of the Lord. To the choir master, a psalm of David. When Nathan the prophet went to him, after he had gone in to Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. We've all heard that David is called the man after God's own heart. He's regarded as a great man of faith who willingly followed God's will. That's how he wanted to live his life. He wanted to live his life to the honor and glory of God. And as we look through the book of Psalms, we see that David is the author of of many of these Psalms, including the one we're, we're reading or looking at today. Now, unfortunately, besides being a man after God's own heart, David is also known for falling into great sin. 2 Samuel 11 tells us of David's deliberate sin of adultery with Bathsheba, and it tells us of his attempt to cover up his sin by murdering her husband, Uriah. What happens, uh, we see in 2 Samuel 11, David is idle. He's supposed to go to war. He's supposed to go and, and be with his men and with his army, but instead he stays home. And this idleness gives opportunity for temptation, which leads David into a great sin. David, as we know, gives in to this temptation. And he commits adultery with Bathsheba. Bathsheba becomes pregnant. And David is faced with a dilemma. Should he allow his sin to come to light? Or should he try and cover it up? And the first thing David does is he chooses the road of deceit. He decides that he wants to cover it up. And he tries to trick Uriah so that he will think the baby is his. Well, this goes down a dark road because 
This doesn't work. And, and we know what happens. We know what happens. This doesn't work, so David goes the next step. He tries, or he does, he, he makes the fatal choice to instead of trying to, um, through deceit, to, to trick Uriah, he decides to cover up his sin. He decides he's going to commit premeditated murder, and he has Uriah killed in battle. This is astounding. This is astounding that a man of God, such as David, could fall into such great sin. There's no excuse for it. What happens here, what David does, is great evil. But what is even more amazing here than this great sin that he falls into, what is even more amazing is that God forgives him. God forgave him for these sins, and God restored David into fellowship with him. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to minimize David's sin here. But what I am trying to do is show God's great mercy for sin. God's great mercy for wicked sinners. The awesome reality of God's willingness to forgive great sin, this wasn't only true in David's time, but this is true today as well. And there are examples of it around us. I've had a great example of, of, of God's mercy. Um, my family, we lived overseas in Cambodia for, for five years. And uh, as many of you may know, uh, in the late 70s, there was a genocide in Cambodia. Close to two million people uh, were killed there. Now, there was this one particular individual. His name was, was Deutsch. Um, he was a part of the communist regime that was there. He was in charge of, of a prison. And under his care and under his command, 12,000 uh, people were killed, tortured and killed, were tortured and killed. He was directly responsible for their murders. And this man, uh, a journalist, found him in, in 1999. He found him in 1999. And what happened is, uh, during his time after this, he had actually become a Christian. He had become a Christian, and he was now, now a school teacher. And when this journalist found him, found out who he was and what he has done, this Deutsch went to the government and turned himself in. He turned himself in for what had happened. And you have to understand, this is very, very uncommon in Cambodia. Through this whole genocide, there were very few people who were ever captured, and there was not one person who turned themselves in, or after the genocide. No one ever turned themselves in for what they had done, but this man did. And all the other individuals, the few individuals who were captured and charged with, with genocide, they made excuses for their sin. They said the higher authorities made them do it, or they didn't do it. They aren't responsible for it. But the one thing that really struck me as I, as I watched this trial going on with this man who had now become a Christian, who had murdered 12,000 people, is he never tried to get out of it. He freely admitted what he had done. He said he, was, he apologized, more than apologized. He pleaded for forgiveness for what he had done. And one of the famous statements he said is Hun Sen, who is the dictator, uh, president slash president of, of Cambodia, he said, Hun Sen has my body, but Christ has my soul. And this, this struck me. A man, a Christian, owning up to a sin. And what even st struck me more is God's willingness to forgive this man such heinous sins. How a person relates to their sins, and this is what I saw in this example, reveals a lot about them. Joel Beakey says, All people have consciences that accuse them of wrong when they go against what they perceive as God's will. Many people free re feel remorse. However, only those to whom God has granted new hearts hate sin as sin and turn from it to the true God. 
And this afternoon, as we're looking at Psalm 51, we're going to be looking at David's plea for mercy. David's plea for mercy and restoration after being confronted with his sin. And as we look here, we're going to see the Christian's right response to sin. And we see this demonstrated in a Christian's pleading for God's righteousness. We see this demonstrated in the psalm in a Christian's contrition for his sin. And we see it in this psalm in a Christian's request for purity and restoration. In the very first verse of this psalm, David pleads to the Lord. He says, have mercy upon me, O God. David has been confronted with his sin. The indictment of the Lord to him, thou art the man, has come to him through Nathan the prophet. And it has rocked David to his core. He has been confronted by his holy God for his grievous sins. Somehow, he has kept his conscience quiet up to this point. Somehow, he has ignored or excused himself for his sin. But now, through this direct confrontation by the Lord, by the Holy Spirit, he now stands face to face with who he is and with what he has done. And David's response, immediate response to this, is he pleads, have mercy upon me, O God. Notice here, there's no excuses. There is no ignoring the sin. The original actually gives the idea that God is pleading for God to be gracious to him, to show him undeserved favor. David recognized where he is standing in God's sight. He, recognize, he, he recognizes that he's no longer feeling the favor of the Lord. He desires to be brought back into the favor of the Lord. He knows that he stands utterly guilty before the Lord and that his only hope for grace and mercy is the grace and mercy of his God. David offers no excuses. He does not say that he did this in a moment of weakness. He does not use his position of authority as an excuse. He does not use his position of authority to rationalize his sin. He does not blame his kingship as as enabling him to commit these great sins. He simply pleads with his God to be gracious to him. And he pleads this knowing that he has no grounds based on his nature and based on his actions of deserving God's mercy. Notice also that as David is pleading for mercy, he is not pleading for the effects of his sin to be taken away. He's not pleading for the punishment of his sin to, to be taken away. He's beyond that. David knows there will be effects. There will be negative effects of, for his sin. And if we read through the narrative, we see that, that there are. But what David desires here most of all, that God would forgive him, that God would again show him favor. And in his pleading, David pleads, he appeals to the only the one thing he can appeal to. He appeals to the only thing that offers him hope. He appeals to the only thing that gives him confidence that he will be forgiven and restored. He appeals to his good and his merciful God. He appeals to the mercy and goodness of God. This is David's only hope. No one and nothing else can solve this problem that David has brought on himself. David knows from experience that God is good. He's had a life full of trials. He's had a life full of suffering up to this point. But he has experienced the Lord being at his a right hand. He knows that God is gracious and willing to forgive sins. This, after all, is the God that caused him to triumph over Goliath. This is the God that caused him to escape from the Philistines. 
This is the God who preserved him from the hand of Saul. We know what David thinks of God. As he writes in Psalm 103, verse 8, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. And David also knows that God is faithful to his covenant promises. This God who anointed him to be king of Israel. And it happened. David's hope is in this covenant-keeping God who promises him a kingdom that will endure forever, a kingdom that would be established by David's descendant, namely Jesus Christ, who would save his people from their sin. David may only have one hope, but this is the best hope. God himself is his hope. The fact that David immediately turns to the Lord in repentance indicates that he has confidence that God, that the Lord, will forgive him. And this is confirmed in his words in verse 14 where he says to the Lord, O God of my salvation. David's calling him here, God of my salvation. He has not given up hope. He knows that this is the Lord who has saved him. He is not despairing of his salvation, for he declares that this God is the God of his salvation. And he also knows that God has forgiven his sin because it was immediately declared to him following his confession of his sin. If you look in 2 Samuel uh, 2, when David is confronted with his sin by Nathan the prophet, he immediately says here, I have sinned against the Lord. And if you look there, Nathan's immediate response to him is, the Lord has also put away your sin. Immediately, David confesses his sin. Nathan says, the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because of this deed, you have utterly scorned the Lord. The child who is born to you shall die. There will be consequences to his sin, but David is forgiven. And David knows that the Lord is the only one who can forgive his sin. And he knows that the Lord is willing to do so. So he cries out to him here in in Psalm 51, blot out my transgressions. In verse 14, he pleads to the Lord to deliver him from blood guiltiness. In the original, this gives the idea that David is literally asking God to obliterate his sin, to wipe his record clean, to acquit him of all his crimes. David wishes to be justified before God. He knows that he cannot stand before a holy God with a tarnished record. And he knows that the only way he can be restored into communion with God is if all his sins are erased. And this is what God does in David's life. Now the wonder of God's work of salvation particularly in justification, is that he does that with each one of us. He wipes a sinner's record clean. The most wicked sinner with the worst record can have every sinful thought, word, and deed wiped from God's record. When the Lord looks at the record of his saints, and he looks at your record, He only sees perfection. And this only happens because of Jesus Christ. This only happens because Jesus came into the world so that your record, so that my record could be wiped clean. Jesus lived a perfect life so that our sins could be blotted out. He took upon himself the wrath of God against sin so that we could be delivered from blood guiltiness. The forgiveness of our sin is freely offered and freely given by the Lord. God is so astoundingly gracious in granting his forgiveness to us. He is so astoundingly gracious in blotting out our transgressions. He discourages no sinner from coming to him for forgiveness. Now, some 
may argue that David's confidence in God's forgiveness and graciousness is a little presumptuous. After all, he has committed incredibly heinous sins. As a believer, he has taken advantage of a woman and, and, and murdered her husband. After doing this, how can David have confidence that his sins are forgiven? How can he so freely go to the Lord and ask for forgiveness? Maybe there should be extended periods, years and years of penance. Well, the Lord, David does go immediately to the Lord. And the Lord does immediately tell him that he is forgiven, that his sins have put away, have been put away. We see here in this psalm, which was written after the fact, that David would continue to bemoan and lament his sins. But he does that as one that is forgiven. And at this point when writing the psalm, he may not even feel the effect of that forgiveness. But the Bible makes it clear that once he confessed his sin, these sins were put away. Now some of, some of you may argue that this makes forgiveness too easy. If all I need to do is confess my sin to be forgiven, will I not use it as an excuse to keep sinning? If forgiveness is so easy, why don't I just keep on sinning and then periodically ask for forgiveness? Well, there are people that think that way. This may be true for those who are antinomians at heart, those who lack true faith and cheapen grace by going through the ritual of asking God for forgiveness just so they can pacify their consciences and continue sinning. If this is your attitude, you should question whether you really are a Christian. However, God's willingness to forgive should never be a stimulus to sin more. A mind and heart enlightened by the Holy Spirit to the mercy and grace of God through the forgiveness of sin should only serve as a stimulus to worship and serve the Lord. Isn't that amazing how that works? The Lord forgives our sins freely. The Spirit works in our hearts. Amazingly, our desire is a want and a desire to serve the Lord. A desire to live a holy life. A desire to follow Christ. The response of the believer to the grace and mercy of God is to live a life of thankfulness. A life of free from sin. Now some others may, may point to Scripture. They may argue that God does not always forgive sin. They may point to the examples where people have repented, but their sins were not forgiven. And there's two notable examples of this in Scripture, and, and, uh, and those are of Esau and of Saul. I'm not going to spend too much time at this, on this, but, but to point out that if you look at the repentances, if you look at Esau's repentance, as noted in, in Romans, if you look at, at Saul's repentance, they, they sound sincere. They seem sincere. David sought repentance with tears. And Saul's repentance sounded much like David's. He said, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. However, both of these are not, were not true repentance. If you look carefully at them, you'll see Esau was sorry because he lost the birthright. Saul blames the people for his sin and was sorry because he would lose his kingdom. These are, this is different from David's repentance. Because when David repented, he did so primarily because it grieved him that he had sinned against his good God. This is not the case with Esau and Saul. They were not that much concerned with that they had sinned against God. They were more concerned for the consequences of their sin. Now these examples of false repentance, they ought not to keep us from seeking the mercy and favor of God. We cannot offer God perfect repentance. This is true. And it is true that right repentance is the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. 
But God plainly makes it known to us. He plainly tells us in his word that if we go to him, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I can't argue with the plainness of 1 John 1 verse 9. And so I point to the God of forgiveness, the one who willingly forgave David, who willingly gave his gracious favor to David. And I urge all of us to repent of our sins. I urge all of us to live a life of repentance to this great God. He came into this world and made repentance and justification possible. He is gracious. He's willing to forgive. David's confidence and our confidence should be in the graciousness of our God. James Boyce says, Mercy is the sole basis of any approach to God by sinners. We cannot come to God on the basis of his justice. Justice strikes us with fear and causes us to hide from him. We are not drawn to God by his wisdom. Wisdom does not embolden us, though we stand in awe of it, no more his omniscience, omnipotence, or omnipresence. The only re reason we dare come to God and dare hope for a solution to our sin problem is his mercy. As we look back at our psalm, we see that David moves from pleading for mercy to showing contrition for sin. David acknowledges his sin in verse 3 where he says, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Again, David does not make excuses for, its, for his sins, but he admits that he has broken the law of God. He admits that he has committed a crime against God. This verse makes it clear again that, this is not the con that it is not the consequences of his sin, but it is the sin itself that is haunting David. His sin is plaguing his conscience. And this causes him to reflect on who he is by nature. He says in verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. He confesses that his sin is a product of who he is, that by nature and without the saving grace of God, he's only sinful. He confesses that he was born and conceived a sinner, and that by nature he is corrupt. Again, he has no, no grounds on which to offer excuses for his sin. He cannot appeal to anything of himself that alleviates his guilt. His sin is utterly his own fault, the product of a sinful heart acting in rebellion against a good God. And David acknowledges this. He says this in verse 4. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. David admits that ultimately he has sinned against a holy and he has sinned against a righteous God. That he has rebelled against a good God and that he is responsible primarily to his God for his sins. Now David is not denying that he has sinned against Bathsheba and Uriah, but that every sin, including this one, are first of all acts of rebellion, acts of hatred for God, and that they are against God's good law. Now David knows that his sins are only his fault, and he has committed them contrary to a good God. And we see that David also acknowledges God's righteous judgment. He says in the second part of verse 4, so you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. He acknowledges the perfect justice of God. He acknowledges that what God is doing to him is right and just. That God is right to, to judge him. That God has done him no wrong. He acknowledges that God is right to punish him and that he deserves that punishment. Now, this is not normally how we act. 
This is not normally how we live. As sinful human beings, we're reluctant to admit when we're wrong. We have a reluctance to, to admit when, when we have sinned. Yeah, sometimes you might say that, yeah, I've done something that I should not have. A few of us will say, I have personally offended God because of my wrongdoing. Now, if you go and, and talk to the average person, and you ask them, most people will say, I'm a pretty good person. Yeah, I may do some wrong things, but the good things I do, they, out, they outweigh the wrong things that I do. And most of the time, when, when we do say, or when we do something or say something wrong, we usually make excuses for our actions. We, th- we say things like, I couldn't help it. Or, you know, this is, this is naturally who I am. I can't help it. Or everyone else is doing it. Or I'm only human. Or the circumstances that I'm in, that it, it forced me to do this. However, the Christian, and David here in the psalm, when truly convicted of their sin and confronted with their perfect God, we can offer no excuses. Our consciences will be smitten and we will confess our sin. We will confess our inclination to sin. We will confess the corruption of our nature that still remains within us. Some years ago, and I was involved in, in jail ministry in, in Grand Rapids at the Kent County Jail, I would go to the, the maximum security section of, of the prison. And uh, this is where they put the, the prisoners in individual cells, either those who had committed notorious crimes um, or those that, for security reasons, needed to be there. <clears throat> and I would go speak one-on-one with, with prisoners there. And um, in jail ministry, you actually have a lot of people who, who want you to, to minister to them, to come to them and pray with them and read the Bible with them. And uh, one of the most common, one of the most common uh, prayer requests is that they, they'd be able to get out of jail, that they wouldn't be found guilty, that they, they could return home, that Jesus would free them from their circumstances. Jesus would free them from the effects of their sin. Well, one Sunday afternoon, I, I walked into the cell area, and, and uh, there's four cells there, four individual cells. And there was one man at the very last cell, and a big, big, big guy. I would not want to meet him in, in a dark alley. Um, and uh, I started, would you like me to, to, to uh, read the Bible with you, pray with you, and talk a little bit? He's like, yeah, yeah. So I, I started I was reading the Bible and praying with him and asking for prayer requests. And his prayer request was um, that the Lord would sustain him in prison. The Lord would, would help him to minister to others and uh, help him to grow in, in, in uh, the grace and the knowledge of the Lord, help him to live his life for God's glory for the rest of his days in prison. He, uh, um, he hadn't even been sentenced yet. So as I, I talked to him more, it, it really struck me, this man knows and loves the Lord. And I didn't ask him what he had did. Of, of course, it was, it was something serious if he was in this section of the prison. But a few days later, I opened the Grand Rapids Press, and there was a story there about him. I'm like, oh, I know this guy. I don't, I don't remember his name anymore, but I, I opened the Grand Rapids Press, and I was, I was reading Reading, uh, reading the story of his case. And like Deutsch, the guy I talked about in the beginning, this man had done a horrible crime. He would killed someone execution style. And he was going to prison for the rest of his life. But one thing that, again, really struck me is, at his trial, he didn't plead for mercy. He didn't make excuses for his sin. He freely admitted, I have done it. It is wrong. And he spent a long period of time speaking to the family of the man that he had murdered. 
begging for their forgiveness, admitting what he had done. And, you know, it just, it's just really struck me. We see the Lord has worked in this man's life. And this man has committed a horrible crime. But one thing is for certain. Although this man is probably still in prison, he's probably still paying the price for his crime, even though this man has a criminal record that will never go away, you know what the amazing thing is? The amazing thing is, is that this man is free. This man is free because Jesus Christ died on the cross for his sins. And in God's eyes, his record is wiped clean. Our sins, our nature, and God himself confront us with who we are. And they demand a response. And the only right response, whether we're a criminal, whether we're a just citizen, no matter who we are, we're as all of us as sinners, it demands that we turn to the Lord, repent and repent of our sins, that we live a life of repentance and contrition. No excuses, no blaming others, only blaming ourselves. But the amazing thing is repentance isn't the only thing the Lord demands. The Lord doesn't only demand that we repent of our sins, but the Lord demands that we believe the gospel. The Lord demands faith. He demands that we believe his word, not only to believe that we are sinners and that we need to repent, but he demands that we believe in him that we trust him for the forgiveness of our sins, that we trust him to change our lives, to make us more like him, to give us the joy of salvation. These things are not impossible things. Yes, true repentance and faith are spirit work and God-given, but this should not make us hesitate or prevent us from believing the gospel. For God freely works salvation. He freely works forgiveness in those who come to him. His offer of forgiveness is freely offered and freely given. Well, notice in our last point here that David isn't content with just forgiveness. He's not content with only forgiveness. He does not just want his sins forgiven that he, so he can go on living his life. But David also wishes to be purified. He says in verse 2, Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. In verse 10 he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. David is wishing to be cleansed, to be sanctified from his sin. His sin has affected and darkened his soul and he wishes his soul to be pure again. David's request for purification here also has ceremonial implications. In verse 7, he says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. David wishes to be purified with, with hyssop, purged with hyssop. David is referencing a purification rite that is recorded in Leviticus 14, where a brush made from a hyssop shrub, was dipped in the blood of a clean bird and brushed seven times on a leper in order that they would be cleansed. The leper would then be declared clean and could rejoin the people of God. So David here, healed of his leprosy, which signifies sin, David, healed of his sin, wishes to be declared clean again and be able to take part in worship. David wishes to take part in worship, but again to have fellowship with believers and to be restored into communion of God. We see this in verses 8, 11, and 12. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Cast me not away from your presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with the willing spirit. David, though his sins are forgiven, wishes to know the joy of serving and having communion with God again. He wishes to again experience the favor of God and to walk daily with him. 
this communion with God, this joy of salvation, this walking with the Lord. It should be the delight of every single Christian. Now, thankfully, when we have walked away from communion with God, when we have sinned, the Lord does not leave us to go our own way. But he's just jealous for our attention. He's jealous for our company. And he causes us to realize what we are missing. And he brings us back to him. And he does this with his arms wide open. He brings us back to him so that we can be purified from our sin. And be, being purified from sin may not be pleasant. And there may be hard lessons that we need to learn. But the Holy Spirit will teach us to walk in obedience. He will teach us to love walking this way. Once we are the recipients of God's grace and forgiveness, we will wish no longer to sin, but to walk in perfect obedience to our great God and Savior. Walking as a Christian, walking in obedience, walking, living a sanctifying life might be hard. It will be hard. But one thing is certain, we will hear joy and gladness. To walk in fellowship with our great God and Savior, being indwelt by the Holy Spirit, this is our greatest joy. As we grow in the grace and knowledge of our King, as we experience His grace, His mercy, His forgiveness, each and every day, our hearts may grow weary of our sin, but we rejoice that Jesus has forgiven our sin. We rejoice that Jesus has saved us from our sin. Though growing in grace can be difficult, though we have hard lessons to learn, it is a great blessing and a great joy to be shaped and molded into the image of God, to become more and more like our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the day is coming, dear Christian, when this will be perfected, when we will finally be with our Lord, when we will finally be perfect, when we will finally be free from sin and be able to perfectly worship our great Savior. Do all of you know what it means to repent before Almighty God, to become nothing in His sight, have your excuses and righteous boasting been silenced by the revelation of your sin and the reality of a most righteous God? Have you experienced this grace and forgiveness of God, the joy of walking in God's favor? Perhaps you think this is too good to be true or that you're too much of a sinner to be forgiven. The lives of David... Comrade Deutsch, the lives of this criminal, this murderer, they say otherwise. So I urge you this day to turn to the Lord, to bring all of your sins, all of your rebellion, and lay them before this great God. Repent and believe the gospel. To all of us who walk under the banner of Christ, who are washed in his blood, I declare to you that we are truly free. We who live lives of repentance, bemoaning our indwelling sin and the times that we fall into sin, know this. Through Christ and through his spirit, we will win this war against sin. Satan and sin will be destroyed. And our great Savior, who has so graciously forgiven us, the day is coming when he will make everything right. Amen. Let us pray. Our holy and merciful Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your, for, for your forgiveness, that your Holy Spirit works forgiveness in our hearts, and that you freely call each of us to come to you to repent of our sins. And we know, Lord, that you freely forgive us. So, Lord, 
Be with us in this week. Bless this message to our hearts. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.